Brought to you direct from Studio 3B at Baird Brothers Fine Hardwoods, the American Hardwood Advisor is your source for trends, tips, and insights into how the building industry has evolved. Join me, Steve Stack, along with guest builders and industry leaders as we talk shop and go in depth on what it takes to be the best of the best. Dive into topics like architecture, industry trends, project plans, historical tools, tricks of the trade, and life's lessons from more than six decades of experience in the hardwood lumber business. Hey folks, we've got a good one for you today. We are uh, back at Studio 3B, Steve Stack coming to you. And uh, if you're entertaining hardwood flooring, uh, we're, we're gonna run the gamut today. I have a hardwood flooring specialist, Mr. Mike Jones of Mike Jones Hardwood Flooring and uh, a friend and partner of Baird Brothers. Mike, welcome to Studio 3B, man. Thank you, Steve. We've been trying to catch up. <laughs> we've been trying to catch up to you. Thanks for coming over today. Uh, we've, got, we've got a ton of stuff to talk about. I appreciate it. And yeah. uh, we're, gonna, uh, we're gonna let you introduce yourself to the folks uh, watching or listening. And uh, we're gonna learn some stuff about you. You're gonna learn some stuff about us. And most importantly, the audiences are going to learn something about hardwood flooring. All right. So, so we're going to go. We're going to go full circle on you today, man. Uh, just what I said. Tell us. Tell us about yourself. I mean, you've been doing this for what? 20, 30, 40 years. Well, like Steve says, my name is Mike Jones. I have a wood flooring company here in Mahoney County. Um, we travel as far as Pittsburgh and um, some parts of Akron, Canton, and Cleveland. Been here for almost 20 years working in this area, and our specialty is refinishing existing hardwood floors. Where'd you start out at? How'd you get involved in the hardwood flooring industry? What happened is I had an older cousin who was working for a wood flooring contractor in, in, in the New York, New Jersey area. <laughs> and he brought me along. I was like a 16, 17 year old kid, and, and that's when I got introduced to the trade. We were installing floors in the Manhattan Hoboken, New Jersey city area. And I think we were getting paid 10 cents a square foot. <laughs> 10 cents, and if that, if you can imagine how much that is, I mean, you put in a couple of thousand square feet and you came home with a hundred bucks probably. <laughs> um, um, not, not, not jokingly, but that's, that's what was the rate, yeah. And we were going to these empty apartment complexes and we'd nail up, nail up flooring. And that's before they had ear, on guns, everything was a little power nailer and a cleat, and they, they sent you in there with a, a power nailer, a mallet, and a skill saw. Yeah. And that skill saw did everything. Right. Did all your end cuts, did all your rips. You pretty much, that's all you had as far as tools. <laughs> and that's that's changed, and, and <clears throat> this is gonna happen. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't even got to, to my questions where, you know, how has the industry changed on you? But you just touched on it. Yeah. The tools that you broke into the trade with right. versus the tools you have today. Exactly. You mentioned the pneumatic nailers, right. uh, a miter box, right. a table saw. Yeah. That, that table saw used to be your skill saw, yep. <laughs> right? Like, like I said, we, we, we'd go into a whole house and pretty much um, a whole apartment complex and all we had was a skill saw and nail guns. I mean power nailers. So pretty much the, now we have table saws, we have skill saws, we have, I mean, jigsaws, we have miter boxes, we have everything. We have uh, compressors, we have guns, we pretty much have everything that makes it a lot easier to do these things with. We didn't even have heat in these places that we would go into right. in the middle of winter. They would put down, that's the other thing too. I mean, no climate control environments. We were installing flooring literally you know, you, your hands were cold, you were getting splinters. I mean, we hated the trade back then. I don't know if I'm saying we as much as I should say I, but I hated it. <laughs> the hardwood flooring trade allowed you to travel coast to coast. I guess so. I guess you can say that. I, I mean, I don't know if that's... It, it deemed that. it traveled. You, tra you traveled <laughs> it coast traveled to coast. with me. Right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I was introduced to it there. I worked a couple of summers. Um, and then when I went moved to Northern California, I pretty much picked up the rest of the trade there. Um, yeah, you can say that. 
you've 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 had to you've had to have seen some cool projects. I mean, uh, every every caliber of home, right? Of course, of course, we've seen a whole lot. I've done a whole lot. I um, one thing I rem- I can I can remember, and I'll let you know about this one is this this high school in um, Clear Lake, California. It was called the Kelseyville High School. Me and four guys were installing this Kelseyville High School gymnasium. Now, with my previous training as a wood floor installer, I was able to install this floor from the baseline all the way up to the the other foul line. No, no, the, the other, yeah, the other foul line before the three guys could take it from their baseline to their foul line. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Can you imagine that? <laughs> That's a lot. Um, because of the method of how we were trained to install floors, we, 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 we got such a little bit of money um, that we had to move. Had to hustle. We had to hustle. You didn't make any money if you didn't know, learn how to, we call it nailing. If you didn't know how to nail, you didn't make any money. So I learned how to nail. And it was like, bam, it was moving fast. And um, we don't nail like that anymore. It's just so that you know. <laughs> we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't nail like that anymore. Matter of fact, if I see any of my guys trying to nail up a floor that fast, I stop them. I'm like, look, you better make sure every crack's <laughs> closed. Right, right? Yeah, you better make sure you do every everything correctly. So, so you spent some time out on the West Coast, and then you landed back here in Northeast Ohio. Yeah, um, marriage, family, you know, that brought me to this area where my wife is from this area and there you that's go. how we landed here and it was a good place to come when i got here um into the area um i i would probably say hardwood flooring is the third option for flooring when i moved here 20 years ago first it's carpet second it's tile and then it's hardwood pretty much <clears throat> It was perfect for a wood flooring contractor because the rest of the country, especially in where I was come came from, is hardwood first. Yeah. And every home and garden ba- magazine you look in, it's hardwood first, tile second, carpet last. So now carpet is starting to phase out of this area, and guess who's at the top of the, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So pretty much, um, I'm we're seeing how it's catching up wood flooring trade is catching up to the rest of the country so yeah it's perfect for this area you know we went from tools changing to decorating schemes changing to what i think is uh consumers uh approach or attitudes back to value and the value of hardwood floor and you've witnessed it i'm sure hundreds of times you can go into a home that has hardwood flooring that's 30, 40, 50 years old, and through refinishing, you make it look like a brand new hardwood floor. Exactly. Right? That's exactly what we love to do. Yeah. We like to go into homes, pull up that old carpet, and sand and refinish those existing floors. And <clears throat> obviously, it's cleaner. It's a cleaner process. Um, one of the things that I, you know, Carpet as opposed to hardwood floor, I would probably say wood flooring is, is, is just brings value. It holds its value. You have less maintenance over time and it's everlasting. I mean, once you get your floors, you're finished, you'll never have to do it again, pretty much. So you just, you touched on something and, and I knew this was gonna happen with you because, <laughs> because of, you know, in all, in all seriousness, Mike, uh, you are a hardwood floor specialist from Stopping out here and picking up hardwood floor at Baird Brothers or us delivering it to your job site and you installing new floor and then job site finishing it. I know you've used some of our pre-finished product on new installs, but you touched on you touched on something as far as two things. You touched on the health aspect of hardwood flooring, right? right? Uh, proven, it's better for you. It's cleaner, as you stated. And number two, the other thing you mentioned was the maintenance side of it. What, what product, if you recommend products to clean or maintain hardwood floors with, or something people shouldn't be using on their hardwood floor finishes, because there's a lot of finishes out there, right? right? Uh, and some react adversely to different maintenance products. 
Lend, you know, lead us down that road a little bit as far as what you see. Well, I've seen a lot. I've seen a lot of homeowners, um, women put things and go over, go to the store and, and just buy like revital products. I'm not a fan of revital products. Like if somebody buys something and they put on an existing pre-finished floor or a floor that's just been refinished. You got a beautiful finished floor. You probably should get a cleaner, not a revital product, a cleaner. Just clean your floors. A lot of people like to use vinegar and water. Um, Bona makes a lot of cleaning products that I recommend. I just don't, I am not an advocate of revital products because they start to build up and if you don't clean your floors correctly before you apply them, you're trapping dust and dirt on your finishes. Um, we see a lot of that. Um, people need to educate themselves on that. So, so on that, you're, you're reference, referencing it as revital. And for myself and the folks at home to understand, you're talking about a product that is advertised as revitalizing your floor. Right. Right? Right. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so there's, there, there's got to be some type of chemical reaction involved. To, exactly. So right? the thing is, you don't really want to downplay someone a product that's on the market as much. But I think that's the most harmful thing to a pre-finished floor that's brand new or a floor that's recently sanded and refinished is a product called Revital because now you're changing the sheen of the product. You're changing um, what you actually originally purchased which I don't recommend doing. I just think cleaning is people should learn how to clean your, their floors properly. Um, you, mentioned, you mentioned an old school cleaner, right. vinegar and water. Right. Vinegar and warm water, a rag, Swifter. a sponge mop, Swifter, wrung out, not putting a lot of water onto the floor, right. <laughs> but the, the properties of, of the vinegar and removing dirt and also when that vinegar evaporates off and dries off, you don't have the streaking, right? right? So you're, you're actually taking care of your floors just like you would take care of your windows, kind of same concept. Right. No ammonia-based products though. Um, ammonia kind of breaks down finishes over time. This, is, this conversation could go in a lot of different directions because a lot of people are, have hardwood flooring and taking care of them. My wife takes care of hers with just a Swifter and she does a pretty good job. Um, and I would probably recommend a Swifter for light cleaning, daily, day to day cleaning, but then get on your hands and knees and clean them um, with warm water and vinegar, like once every two weeks or so kind of thing. But that's it. Yeah, <clears throat> and, it, and it can be that simple. Yeah. And, and traffic, traffic comes into play, right. pets come into play, uh, but it's the same thing with carpeting. Exactly. Right? You're either running the Swifter or you're running a, a vacuum. Exactly. So maintenance, you should always, like every once in a while, have a professional come in and look at your floors and, and probably um, do maintenance. You know, maintenance means a nice light, light sanding and a, a new app, you know, new application of a good finish. So, so and, and that's, that's, that's an important uh, comment in that. <clears throat> Let's go new construction home. You install bared four inch maple flooring, right? Uh, you site finish it, okay? And people love it. Seven years down the road, it's starting to lose a little bit of its shine or sparkle. Right. In, a case, a, in a case like that, you just wanna you know, have your contractor, me or whoever, come out there, lightly sand the floors and put another coat on them so that you don't have to sand them down to the raw wood. So kind of get it before it starts getting, you know, don't let it just keep wearing. Right, yeah, right. That's all. Yeah, those those traffic areas. Those traffic areas, exactly. Right? Yeah. <clears throat> and and then, you know, bam, you've got a you've you've you just, got a fresh new fresh floor again. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So if you take care of them properly and do the maintenance accordingly, you, your floors will always look fresh and brand and new. Yeah. And going back to the value aspect of it floors that were installed in homes here in the Mahoning Valley back in the 30s and 40s and into the 50s. Two and a quarter, strip flooring, red oak, white oak, some maple. Right. Like you've said, 
you pull the carpet back on those and you still have a quality hardwood floor that just needs a facelift. And that's pretty much what we do most, most of the time, that's what we're doing. Um, and a lot of times there's some repair under there and we do those and then we just sand and refinish the whole thing. Um, you can change it to a darker floor or a lighter floor. It just doesn't matter. You got your clean palette when you're dealing with that. Um, I thought it was like code that they built houses with wood flooring planks under them because I, it kind of, it's kind of baffles me that if carpet was the number one choice of flooring here in the valley for so long, right. um, why is there strip flooring under all of these homes? <laughs> but I think it was code that they had to have um, wood flooring installed when they built the home. So yeah, so if you just bought a house or you're thinking about buying a house, peel back that carpet and let's see if you got some wood floor already. And, right. um, and then, you know. So, so you, 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 run the, you run the gamut <clears throat> on your services for Mike Jones hardwood flooring, right? New, uh, new installs. New installs. Uh, repairs, refinishing. Repairs, re repairs are huge, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. And, and that's, we're not going to have you divulge all, all of your tricks of the trade per se, but when it comes to repairing, replacing some hardwood floorboards, or extending into another room, uh, there are some tricks, right? Oh, yeah, there's a lot uh, of tricks. You know, you can, you can talk to different people, and I know you're gonna recognize it as soon as it comes out of my mouth, extending a room into another living area. And rather than have that one long butt joint, there's a procedure process called weaving, right? We call it weaving, some call it nesting. What we do is we nest or weave into the old floor and you don't have a break. And it and then we sand and everything and then stain everything and just and yeah. Just grows it's together. A beautiful transition, of course. Yeah. Doing one as we speak. But um yeah. So yeah. we do that quite a bit. So let's go let's go and and uh we've talked about the refinishing. Uh, there's a lot society in general has changed, that folks are, are willing to investigate doing a project themselves, the, the DIYer. Uh, doable, yes, uh, but advantages, disadvantages. Uh, do you have the tools, right? right? Uh, do you have the knowledge? Well, we can we can go out on social platforms and, right. and, and figure out the knowledge. Edu educate the biggest yourself. thing is the time. Do you have the time? Obviously, if you don't do something every day, it's going to take you twice as maybe three times as longer as someone that does do it every day, and that's that's a big factor. And um, after you spend all that time, it still may not come out. So, what did you gain by doing it yourself? If you know, if you don't oh, have true. the time and the materials and the machinery to do it, so um, you might as well get it done. It depends on what your time is worth, right? You know, and there's there there's a lot of things to be taken in consideration, and and I know uh, our sales staff here at Baird's, we've we've become uh, proactive in helping people do their own, right? Well, in, in helping people do it themselves, but even in, in the case where uh, they have Mike Jones coming into their home for a new install, setting expectations, right. talking about maintenance, and most importantly, job site conditions prior to receiving that delivery of hardwood floor. We send our product out, our flooring product, six to eight percent moisture content, right? And we know that the underlayment, it needs to be at a certain moisture level also. Right. So the new floor at six to eight percent doesn't clash with the existing. Doesn't clash and, and pull moisture from the, the underlayment, right? Take us through a little bit of that, you know, some of well, your knowledge. From my knowledge, we don't really have that problem in existing older homes because the floor has been installed for years and years and years. So the moisture content of that house, everything in that house is going to be more stable. But new construction is one of the one of the biggest things that that will happen. Whereas like these houses, they they build them within a year or so and put the roof on, um, and then they call you like we're ready for the floor. <laughs> right. Um, 
and that's not going to work because if the roof <clears throat> hasn't been on long and in the in that um, that subfloor is not completely dried out, you can't just go in there and put a new floor on top of it without you know checking all the moisture content and all that stuff because your floor will react to that that floor that's in there already. Right. And when I say react. That moisture in the um, subfloor could be somewhere over 20, 30 percent, something really high. So that has you have to take all those precautions. You have to, you know, you have to stick. To and that's that's the perfect word, precautions. Right. Uh, you don't want to set yourself up for failure. Right. Right. And and uh, you know, job site conditions, whether it be whether it be any of the four seasons, but we'll go summer, winter. We, we advise folks to make sure that the permanent heat source is in place. And it's been running for. And it's been running. And in the case of summer, the air conditioning units. Uh, also, I, I'm a firm believer in uh, dehumidification. Uh, air conditioning helps. Dehumidification really makes that air conditioner do more than it would on its own, right? Uh, you know, and, and depending, depending on what the weather's like outside, when you, when you receive new hardwood flooring, do, do you always go through an acclimation time? There has to be an acclimation time because basically you got people ordering floors for new homes that the windows only went in a week before the floor has arrived. Those, those are all red flags. Well, you got to ask questions. So when are your windows and when your doors gone? You know, when, how long has the roof been on? And those are the things that are, are essential. So that floor needs to go in that house and it needs to set in there for about a week or two or a couple of weeks before you start installing. And then you need to go in there with moisture meters and check that subfloor and all that stuff before you install the hardwood floor. So if you got your do-it-yourselfers, like you're saying, those yeah. are the precautions that they need to take. Um, versus versus going into a home that might be 30 years old. Right. And okay, let's let's pull the carpet out of the dining room and there's particle board underneath it or plywood underneath it. Because that house has that age right. and it has gone through a natural process of drying down, right. you could take flooring from Baird's into that home. And install it after three days of it just sitting inside that house. Yeah, yeah. right? And there you're good, yeah. That's the difference between the two. Right, new construction, existing. Existing, yeah. Yeah, that's the difference between the two. You just got to be a little bit more careful with new construction and make sure your your environment is so conducive to what your product is going to be. You know, and, and I reference uh, literature from the National Hardwood Flooring Association. They have a a lot of great literature available at their website for both you and I, the professionals, right. and for the homeowner. You know, even if even if they have you install their floor, there's good information in there for them how to control the environment inside their home so the floor don't run away. And you know exactly what I'm talking about when I say run away on you. And... <clears throat> So that's a good reference for folks. Yeah. National Hardwood Flooring Association, uh, a, a lot of good guidelines and, and, and how to. Because when we drop that floor off at a job site, the floor becomes your possession. You install it. Everything's fine. And, and then, now it's the homeowner's possession and the homeowner's responsibility to take care of it. Keep it yeah. Keep the moisture good in the house and the whole nine yards. Yep, yep. So you don't get that call, right? Right, right. <laughs> you know, and 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 in being a little bit proactive, and and forward thinking, if 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 you you tell folks, uh, I mean, I've witnessed it here in the studio, just over the past year. My cupboard doors were getting a little tight on some of the double doors, and I said, wait a minute, they're growing. So then I started looking at the hardwood floor and says, wait, it's pushing too. Right. So we introduced a dehumidifier, right? I mean, it's air conditioned, but we had to get that dehumidifier Did to get that. Did it work out? Yeah, right. yeah, right? But you, you, have to, you have to know to identify it right. so you can act on it, right? No, I, I, I know I have, um, we run into it all the time. So yeah, definitely have to have a dehumidifier in your house, in newer homes.
<laughs> we talked about some of the plywood and and uh, uh, as as a subfloor underlayment. Uh, back in the day, it was one by six, one by eights, run on a diagonal across the floor joist, right. pine boards, you know, and and so before we introduce hardwood flooring, and there's a couple options. What do you prefer as an underlayment paper? We like Aquabar, which we get right here at Bear Brothers is one of the better um, underlayment products. One of the reasons why I like Aquabar is if I'm not putting it down myself, I don't have to worry about um, it scarring new painted walls or new painted baseboard. Versus, versus the black felt 15 paper, pound, right? 15 pound felt. Right. So my guys are running 15 pound felt and then I'm like, I'm watching, like, look, stay away from the baseboards. They were freshly painted. Stay away from the walls. They're freshly painted. Because as soon as that stuff, as you're rolling it out, touches any paint, it's going to, you know, it marks it. It's, it, it. So um, Aquabar is the best, and you can only get that at Bear Brothers. <laughs> so, and and just, just for the folks listening or watching, there's basically three underlayment Options. products, right? Yeah. There's Aquabar, there's 15 pound felt, and those two products have a, it's adding a moisture barrier between your subfloor and your flooring. So it, and it has um, a dual process to it. It actually helps soften um, the hollowing sound of walking on your floor. And, and, and the third would have been the red rosin paper. Red rosin pretty much for me, it doesn't have any, right. any usage. So, so Aquabar, they were they were pretty wise, and they developed a product that took the uh, moisture barrier from a fifteen pound uh, felt from yeah. from the fifteen pound felt, mm -hmm. and they've embedded that between two layers of something similar to a, a rosin awesome. paper. Right. So so you get both the benefits. Right. You get the the uh, moisture transmission barrier, uh, but you get the workability of the red rosin paper because it is paper faced on both right. sides so you get the workability i've been on job sites and i've installed floors with with the old 15 pound felt right and the next thing you know you're stepping off the hardwood floor onto the felt back onto your hardwood floor and, you're marking your and then you've got tar emulsion <laughs> embedded into the you know where where the aquabar product doesn't do that at all aquabar is the best product bar none um rosin it's too light for for me personally, but you know people use it. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. But it it doesn't. It, it still allows moisture transmission. Right. It's just yeah. paper. Yeah, yeah. So and 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 not only not only from direct contact with the subfloor to the underside of the hardwood flooring, but whatever's going on in the lower level of that home, that in, environmental condition seeping up through. And that's why we use it, right? Right. From the unfinished basement, um, from the lower levels of the home. Yeah, that no. kind of thing. One, one step further, still talking about uh, an underlayment substrate of some form. We're seeing more and more, in different situations, more and more adhesives, oh. right? So... Uh, and there's there's flooring adhesives for the whole gamut, from from uh, uh, laminate products to engineered flooring products like we offer here, mm -hmm. to even solid wide plank. Right. Right. Take us through that a little bit. I know you've you've well, had firsthand experience there. Well, right now, like say if you have new construction and you want to do a wider plank installation, is definitely recommend that you glue and nail that plank flooring because your floor is not going to go anywhere if you use a really good adhesive. We have this stuff in Barrett. Barrett carries a product called Bostic. Bostic makes a, a really good adhesive so that when this floor is installed, it's not going anywhere. You're not having any climate control problems at all. It's not going to move at, after it's installed. It's just permanent, period. Um, and these products are low VOC, um, which before years ago, <laughs> um, you had to have respirators to, <laughs> to, to yeah, apply, you right. know, subfloor adhesives. But now they're low VOC, meaning that they're, they're you know, the emissions are is pretty much zero. Um, they're really good products, um, and again, um, it really eliminates the moisture issue 
from below. And that's what's happening now with new engineered installations. They're gluing them and they're pretty much permanent. Most large plank installations are, are applied with um, Bostics and you're pretty much be pretty much good after that. So it it allows it allows the consumers options. Right. In that, I mean, old school philosophy, solid plank hardwood floor was advised at grade or above grade, never below grade. Right. 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 But with the new engineered products and some of the new adhesives, you can take an engineered product down to the lower level of the home. Right direct apply to concrete, right. or if you're using a wide plank on the first floor of the home or second floor of the home, uh, you can use some of these same adhesives as the insurance policy along with nailing wood to wood. Right, so if you use this adhesive on any level, pretty much in the basement, it's gonna protect you from the, the moisture from the slab, the existing slab, whether it be an old slab or it be a new slab. If you can install right above a on a slab with an engineered product or a plank, um, glue it down, um, you're good. You're good with this stuff. And then like on the first and second and third level, if you use that, use an adhesive um, like Bostix um, for your installation, your floor is pretty much not gonna move. Um, we love it. Conditions have to get extreme yeah. for, for that product to fail. Yeah, like you, the roof. Roof has to have a big giant hole and must have, you know, you know I, I think standing water will pretty much have a hard time um, affecting the product. I'm, I'm sure it probably would, but yeah. Uh, you know, and, and that's, so we've covered, you know, we've covered the, the vapor barriers per se. Um, and one thing we didn't touch on is uh, with the Aquabar product and the adhesive products, you have a very quiet floor because you're not right. wood on wood, right? right? Uh, so that's something else we wanted, we wanted to mention. There's, there's numerous uh, reasons for using that one of those products between your hardwood floor and your subfloor, whatever the case may be. Uh, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, one of the most common installation failures I have witnessed over the years put the floor too tight, don't leave your expansion room around the perimeter of the floor, right? What, what do you normally run? Half, three quarters? Ooh, half inch, half inch expansion pretty much. I mean, depends on what you're, a lot of times if I'm doing a new installation, I'm kind of gonna, I'm gonna recommend that a person has at least a three quarter base. Um, so you can use, leave a half inch expansion gap around. Um, but a lot of, you know, sometimes you can't really tell um, people what to do. Sometimes <laughs> they may have an idea that they can use a half inch base or something like that. And it's just not enough expansion. You're going to have that floor is going to move and it's just going to not give you enough expansion around the edges. So you have to have um, a certain amount on new installation. So, yeah, half inch would be really good. You know, I always I always tell folks. Uh, Quarter inches, okay, too. Yeah, but but I always tell folks, you know, if you have a if you have a room that's twenty foot wide, sixteen foot wide, right? <clears throat> then you're laying a five or a six inch floor, and conditions are such that the floor wants to expand because it's picking up moisture from the atmosphere, the environment. And if each one of those boards grow a 64th of an inch in width, hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And you think about it and they start to push, they're gonna run out of room fast. Right. And when they run out of room, you've seen it, you've repaired right. them, where somewhere that uh, it, it's not necessarily nail failure, but the weakest point of that floor, it's gonna, it's gonna right. cone up on you, right? right? And then you've got a project. Yeah. You got to go in and you got to cut it out. You got to fill it in. You got to do stuff like that. Again, that's not always because of, you know, um, because of, of not enough expansion. That could be because you're getting just a lot of moisture. Yeah. Your, your, out of, your environment is not controllable. So you have like, in, in, you know, extreme temperature changes, um, water. <laughs>
No, no, no. There, and there's there, yeah, a, a, a lot of a lot of things can cause, uh, okay. but it, but it all comes down with that hardwood floor growing because of some source of moisture. Exactly. Right. Uh, so you know that's 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 always important. And and again, referencing back to the National Hardwood Flooring Association. That's one of the guidelines that they set forth, uh, you know, is perimeter spacing. Right. Um, so you go, you go in and somebody calls you, wants you to come into their home and they're entertaining refinishing. Okay. Maybe it's an old, older floor. Maybe it's a floor that's 10 years old. Yep. There, there has to be a line in the sand where, where you walk into a, a, a potential customer's home and say, we can't save this for, right. right? Yep. I mean, you can you can you can do yep. a lot. Yep. Pull some miracles out every once in a while, but well, real quick, I walked into a very old home. Um, actually, it's going to be a bed and breakfast, and it was in Poland, downtown Poland. And the guy comes in, um, wants me to come in um, and sand and refinish the fir whole first level. So when I first come, when I come in the house, and he said two other guys looked at it. And so when I come in, all I see is like nails, nails. You can see the nails at each joint exposed up and down each row. So that's indicative of me that the floor has been sanded quite a bit of times and it's pretty much thin and it's not, you know, I'm not going to put my sanders on them because they already got nails um, showing up and down each row. So those are floors that usually you want to recommend that that client ent entertain the idea of putting a new floor in. You know, some people are on like, well, you know, that's not in the budget, but <laughs> you know, yeah. but they need a new floor in. They would need to come in and get a, um, start shopping for a new floor. And that's kind of rare that you would see a situation like that in any old home because wood floor refinishing is not that popular to begin with in the area. It hasn't, you know, so you're not going to walk into too many structures where the floor has been sanded a half a dozen times. It's just not going to happen. Right. So it's rare. But in some markets, some markets, that is, you know, when wood flooring has been the top of the flooring train, you're going to walk into a house where a floor has been sanded five or six times. Right. And, and the flooring has its limitations. Right. The product has its limitations. Uh, so that's, that's that, yeah. But other than that, most floors, um, just before you jump off that subject, there are other things, there are other factors other than flooring being sanded too many times. A lot of times we run into houses where people have pets that are, aren't let out to walk or just go to the bathroom. So they pull up the carpet, they have these beautiful hardwood floors, but they have these big giant pet stains pretty much everywhere. Sometimes those floors can be saved, the floors can be sanded and go as, as dark as an ebony, a dark stain, and sometimes um, they can't. You know, um, we've, we've done some really dark stains and we've rescued some really, really, really bad pet stained, urine stained floors. And, and, and so the product, and I, again, I don't care whether we're talking about carpet, whether we're talking about beautiful tiles, or whether we're talking about hardwood, there's expectations and limitations uh, with your to product, those products. Yeah, yeah. So on that, on finishing, and I know you do a lot of both, of uh, old school, which I refer to it, yeah. installing the hardwood flooring raw, unfinished. So old school, yeah. Right? Yeah versus uh, using one of Baird's pre-finished products. Yep. Uh, I think both have their pros, yep. right? Uh, but there are limitations involved also. Uh, and, and I said old school, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm referencing and dating myself again, but in the job site finishes, as we've referred to it. Uh, it's evolved over the years. Uh, it's a much cleaner process now. Mm -hmm. One thing that hasn't changed is the palette of colors that you can accomplish job site, right? right? If I have a, a beautiful white oak table 
and I want to come into that coloration to match that white oak table, you can do that right. on, on job site finish, right? We provide stain charts. I mean, you got almost 30, 40 options of different colors. So pretty much just like paint colors almost with flooring. I mean, I've seen people do blue rooms, blue floors, green floors. I mean, you pretty much can stain your hardwood floors. If you can imagine it, you could do it with, the, um, with color. Um, so yeah, we provide stain charts and if you go online, you see something you like, we try to, you know, we do what we can to try to um, duplicate that process for you. Um, yeah, so you can, do, you can do what you want as far as color. Um, and, and the finishes that you have available to you today right. for on-site finishing, they've made a lot of advances. Exactly, well, there used to be, uh, I mean, there used to be lacquer-based finishes, finishes that you had to be out the house for almost two to three days between each coat. For the off-gassing. Right, for the emissions that were they emitted. Um, then, you know, I mean, the evolution of finishes, period, we can go into that. But let's not. Because <laughs> they, <laughs> be they've evolved. The let's, let's, just, let's just go to where they are now. Solvent-based finishes are pretty much dry within 45 minutes per application, an hour and a half tops um, solvent-based finishes. So you can actually have a floor sanded, refinished, and have three coats applied and be done within a 24-hour period, um, which that that's changed. That's that It's been like that for probably the last 15 years. Right. So when if you're in a house and you're having your downstairs, your first level refinished, Literally, you'll be able to walk on your floors 45 minutes between each application. So it's not like you have to move out anymore to have your hardwood floors refinished anymore. That's done. It's almost like the same concept as latex paint now. Um, you can have your walls painted and it be dry. Yeah. And you can come back in your house an hour and you don't have to worry about not touching the walls. Same thing with your floors. Yeah. Um, yeah, so they've made they've made huge advancements. Huge advances, huge right? advances. And the finishes are harder, stronger, um, in all the different properties that we need them to be. So, yeah, yeah you're getting a, a good protective wear layer, exactly. yep. uh, you know, and, and that's going going back to uh, we offer both the unfinished yep. and the pre-finished. Uh, now, the pre-finish, going back to what you were saying, pre-finish has these advances, has the advantage of if you have a pre-finished insulation, pretty much the floor goes in, it's done. Move so, the furniture back yeah, in. Yeah, move the furniture back in, you're good. Um, and that's really helpful for people that are like really solvent or, or really sensitive to any kind of products. Right. You know, some people just can't handle anything. Yeah. So yeah, so a pre-finished floor. It's, would it's, probably... it's that and and the conveniency of it. Rather exactly. than rather than being tied up for two days or three days, nail it down. Nail it down. Put the furniture, put the furniture in. Back, you're done. And yeah. Very little inconvenience. It's the most efficient way right. to have your have have you're done. Limitations. We like to stay in our lane a little bit and offer nine to ten, eleven different stain colors on the eight different species that we offer. So your palette's limited a little bit that way. But I, I, if, if you look at, you know, what, what I just said, you know, say there's 12 and, and nine, uh, tr uh, twelve colors and eight different species, you know, there's over a hundred options. Well, <clears throat> to your question about that, I've, I, I don't see that when the sand refinish on site, I don't see people running a gamut of the 50 to 60 flooring options. It's yeah. still, you know, people are back to the 10 or 12 different options. That, you know, I don't see a lot of people yeah. doing green floors or blue floors or, you know what I mean? I see the white floors a lot, but you know, there's it's still, you know. Lately, lately we've been, we've been seeing uh, a, a lot of the grays in the ebonies, yeah. right? A lot of gray I floors. I mean, we, we offer, we offer a couple different gray, uh, gray stains now and, yeah. And, uh, but again, you know, the nice thing about it, 10 years when, it, when it's no longer in style. And sand it off and start it, <laughs> start fresh. Get exactly. caught up, get, get yep. caught up to the decorating yep. that's going on. Yep. Uh, do you have, do you have a, a certain species that you like to work with more than others? White oak would probably be my favorite product. Um, you and the rest of the world yeah. right now, right? Yeah, white oak is, is, is just a beautiful, 
it's just a beautiful grain of wood. It, it accepts stain well. I mean, it's just, it's just really, it's really a nice product. Durability. Durability, I mean. Uh, and, and the, like you say, the, the staining of it, uh, we're seeing a lot of it just clear coat now. Yeah. I mean, it has a, it has a natural Gorgeous beauty floor. to yeah, it. It's a beautiful floor. It's, you know, um, yeah, it's a beautiful floor. Yeah. Wear and tear. I mean, you know, let's, let's go through it. I mean, the hickories, the red oak, the white oak, the quartered reds, the quartered whites, the maple, uh, you know, for that knockout home office den, lower traffic, you can entertain a walnut or a cherry and really set it off knowing that it's not necessarily a high traffic area. We go back to the Jenka table, right? Mm -hmm. and, and see the face density. Uh, but with the different woods come different characteristics, not only in grain, but physical properties right. as far as expansion and contraction. Uh, Hickory's the wild child. I mean, you really gotta stay on it to maintain the environment inside that home mm -hmm. so it don't run away on you. Okay. You know, because it, it will react, all wood will react to moisture. Right. Some react quicker and more drastically, you know. Maple is probably most unstable. Maple can, can do some crazy stuff too, you know. And, and uh, then there's the tried and true red oak. Uh, yeah, red and white, come on. Oak is pretty much your product. You can, you're, you're, you're good with oaks. Um, and hickory too, isn't hickory pretty? Strong? Oh, hickory is, is one of our, our more dense native hardwoods, but uh, because, because of its, its cellular structure and, and it, if it picks up moisture, it's, it's gonna go somewhere. It's gonna move. So you gotta be careful on that. Uh, but they, with controlled conditions inside of the home, they're all gonna make you a beautiful floor. Exactly. You know, and then you come in and work your magic with, with the, the sanding and, and the, the stain. And we should touch on that. In the case of our pre-finished floor, and you know it, it has a, a slight micro beveled edge, right. right? Which when you install those boards parallel side by side, there's a minute mm -hmm. micro, bevel, exactly. micro bevel, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that conceals any unevenness, helps conceal any unevenness in, in the install, right. right? Where old school, old school, <laughs> square edge, old school, square edge flooring. Okay. We'll, we'll bring up any, any, any and everything that's in that subfloor and any and everything that's in that house. So if your house is sloping a little bit, whatever. <laughs> right. And, and so therefore the sanding after install, uh, but to the decorator, the interior decorator side of things, it's a different look. It's a cleaner look. The square edge. No identifying each individual strip per se, other than through the grain changes and things like that. Uh, some consider it a more formal look, you know, so Again, two different floors in a square edge, smooth surface versus our micro, which is very minute, but you can identify it. Right. You know. Yeah. Most pre-finished products are, only, are gonna come with the micro bevel. Right, with um, reason. Whether it's engineered, yep. whether it's, it's just, it's one of the criteria of a pre-finished product. You're not gonna get too many pre-finished square edge floors. There are some, very expensive. And when you put them down, your subfloor has to be completely flat with no, 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 no variations at all. Um, and when those, when when you get a floor like that, and I've done a couple actually. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So and they go in like it's just everything fits perfectly. So, yeah. We've covered a bunch, friend. Did we? <laughs> I think you covered a bunch. <laughs> I just kind of. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anything from anything from uh, a little background on you, and uh, you've you you can say you've installed hardwood floor from coast to coast. I can, <laughs> right? I can say that. I can say that. Well, we're glad yeah. to have you back in the Mahoning Valley. Yeah, and uh, I've sanded floors from coast to coast too. Yep. Yeah, yep. you yep. know, yep. Yep. and uh, you you cover the gamut from install to to refinishing. Uh, 
and you've you've kind of crafted your trade. Like I say, you're 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 chasing me at that forty year mark, <laughs> doing doing what you love to do because I know you love to do it, man. Oh, I can't do anything else. It's done. It's done. Hey, Steve. Thanks for coming back and visiting us you, today. Thanks Appreciate for having it. me in. And uh, folks, until next time, uh, more information come from the specialist, Mike Jones, Mike Jones Hardwood Flooring. Stay tuned. More to come on the social. For all you folks listening, thanks for talking shop with Baird Brothers Fine Hardwoods. If you've enjoyed this episode and want to stay up to date with the American Hardwood Advisor Series, give us a like and subscribe. For more tips, projects, and inspiration, check us out on Facebook, Instagram, or at BairdBrothers.com. Until next time, 